Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome to A Word from the Lord. James Ophir here with you, and we hope that all those individuals who are who were called in uh, last hour, the phones were lit up, and then right as they're getting the countdown, they one by one went off. So uh, <clears throat> if you want to call in, we'll take your phone calls uh, tonight. We're glad to hear from you. Uh, some good discussion going on with Kayla's program. But until then, folks, here's how you can reach me at wordfromthelord at gmail.com is how you can reach me by email, 276-340-2653 is how you can reach me by phone. If you'd like to study God's Word, we'd be glad to do that. If you're in the area, in Eden, we meet at 250 the Boulevard, and we meet at Sundays at 9 a.m. for class and 10 a.m. for worship. Thursday at 7 p.m., and we'd be glad to, for you to come out and study God's Word with us anytime you have a chance. We'd really love to see you and love to study God's Word with you, and uh, we hope that you'll take advantage of the opportunities you have uh, to come out and see us. Uh, friends, tonight, we're going to get right into our, our uh, lesson. But tonight, I want you to consider why, if you've ever thought about this, why people are so confused about what the Bible says. And why do they believe what they believe so dogmatically about what they think the Bible says? I, I was amazed at some of the calls that were coming in, that, especially that one caller that called in and was asking questions and, and insisted that he tripped Caleb up and, and made his point. Well, the only point he made was proving that he was confused about what the Bible said. And if he would call back in, I think we could finish helping uh, clear some things up if he would see it. But friends, when you hear people talk, not just that caller, when you hear people talk about the Bible and you hear, hear them saying what they believe and why they believe it, it's evident to individuals who have studied the Bible that you know what, There's a, there is some reason why they got to this point. And even if you think you know the Bible very well, or if you don't know the Bible very well, there's a reason why you're at the point you are. We're all a product of our learning experience, of our teaching, whether what we have been instilled in, in the truth or whether we have been taught error. We're all the reason, we're the reason of someone telling us something, and then we believe it. We take it at face value, maybe, and we never investigate it. And so when you, want, when you think about, well, why do people believe this about the Bible? You know, when, when I talk to individuals about some things they believe, I'm talking about some strange things. Like they're talking about, you know, they may think uh, angels are floating around their bed, or they may think, uh, you know, that Christ is coming back, and all these signs and these things that are going on in our world today are evidence that, that the Lord is returning, and it's amazing to me why they believe that sort of thing. And so there's a reason why, and I want, I want us to get to that point. You know, Paul made this statement in 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 11. He said that they should believe a lie. Now, if I were not concerned about your soul, and I wanted to trick you or deceive you, how would I get you to believe a lie? How would I get you to believe a lie? Now, one of the callers that called in said that Caleb could keep lying to all the people that he was lying to. Well, he wasn't lying to them. But if we were wanting to lie to you, <clears throat> how would we do that? How, how would, what would be the process to getting someone to believe a lie? Now, I want you to notice something. Paul was very, very, very concerned about what people heard from him. And he was so determined that he was not going to give them a lie. Look what he says. In, uh, let's just stay in 2 Thessalonians. Or, excuse me, let's say, uh, let's go to uh, 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 1. And I want you to notice what, what he says here. In, uh, actually, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. It's where I want to be. He says, For this cause thank we God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth the word of God. Now, what made these individuals receive the word that Paul said as truth and not merely as the word of men? But now, the reason why I ask that is because a lot of individuals today, when you listen to what they say, and you realize they've, got, they've heard their preacher, heard their pastor, bishop, rabbi, whoever it is, 
They've heard this material somewhere. And the result is they received it as the word of God. They received it as the truth, but in reality it was the word of men. What made these individuals in Thessalonica receive Paul's word as the word of God and not as the word of men? Well, we can find, we can find out if we go back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 5. Look what he says. He says, For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power, and in the Holy Ghost, and in much assurance, as ye know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. Paul said, We behaved ourselves in such a way, but also when he preached the gospel, It didn't come just in word only, but it came with power. It came with power from the Holy Spirit, which gave them much assurance. In other words, there was something that was demonstrated that caused these Thessalonians to say, you know what, this is not just some man's words talking. These men are speaking, they're preaching, and they're confirming the word with things that only uh, a person can do if God was with him. That's why he said in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, In verse 4, notice this, he said, My speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. And so when Paul came, he was preaching the truth, and he demonstrated things in such a way that individuals had to say, This is from God. It could not just be from man. This is not just a, a message from man. It's because the miracles that he did were confirming the word, confirming the message as from God. That's why Jesus said in Mark 16 and verse 17 and following, notice what he said. He said, These signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. And they shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. So then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up unto heaven, and sat on the right hand of God, and they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them, what were they doing? What was he doing? And confirming the word with signs following. He confirmed the message with those miraculous signs. Now friends, that's the purpose of miracles. And that's why whenever Paul was preaching, those people didn't say, well, he may be lying to us or he may be telling us something deceitful. No, he was telling the truth. But today we don't have those miracles today. They're not available to us today because the word has been confirmed. But if I wanted to get you to believe a lie then, how could I do it? Because it's easy for someone to come along and say, this is, this is a, a word from the Lord, and someone believes it. So if I want to give you a word from the Lord, how do I get you to believe that, that it really is in fact a word from the Lord? Or if I wanted to get you to believe a lie, how would I get you to do that? Well, friends, are simple steps. If you want someone to believe a lie, or the way people believe lies, are really just like they believe the truth. Only a few things are different. Notice this. Number one, if you want to believe a lie, you have to hear a lie. You know, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. But a lie comes from the devil. Right? So if you want to believe a lie, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of the devil. That's really what it would be about, what it would be like. If someone believes a lie, it must be they heard the devil say something. Jesus said that the devil is the father of all lies. In John 8 and verse 44, John 8, verse 44, notice what he says. Jesus said, You are your father the devil, and the lust of your father what ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. He's the father of lies. Now, if someone's going to believe a lie, they have to hear the lie. And friends, I submit to you that there's a lot of individuals that hear what they think is the truth, but really it's twisted just a little bit, and really what they're hearing is a lie, and they believe that. And if you don't think that the devil is so shrewd that he can change what God said to a lie, then you misjudge, grossly misjudge, the power of Satan. Notice this in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 1. 
Genesis 3 and verse 1. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Now listen to what he said. He got Eve to thinking about what God was not letting her do. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. But the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said, Ye shall not surely die. Now look what he started doing. The first thing he said was, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. God didn't say you cannot eat of every tree of the garden. What God said was, You can eat of every tree of the garden, except one. But the way the serpent made it sound was, God is holding you back. God's not letting you eat of every tree of the garden. Instead of getting Eve to focus on all the things that she could do, Satan gets her to focus on the thing that she can't do. All right? And then he says, Ye shall not surely die. He added one little thing, and thus it changed the truth to a lie. And so, if you're going to hear the truth, it first has to be spoken. Friends, are you sure that everything you hear on Sunday, everything you hear in your Bible studies, in the middle of the week, if you go, everything you hear from God's Word, everything you hear on television, are you sure it's the truth? Now, we don't expect you to take what we say as truth. We want you to check it out. Now, we can't confirm what we say with miracles <clears throat> like they did in the first century, but what we can do is we can confirm what we say with the Word of God. In other words, the sum of God's Word is truth. Every word in here is truth. So if we're saying it, we're going to be able to show it. Uh, show it. And that's what we want you to do. We want you to hear the truth and not, a, and not a lie. Thus, we're going to speak the truth. But the way to get someone to believe a lie is just speak a lie. Just tell a lie. Just talk about it. Because oftentimes what happens is a lie sounds better than the truth. You think about that. Individuals hear a lie and they believe it because the lie oftentimes sounds better. And thus, people don't believe the truth because it doesn't sound near as good as a lie. Now look what Paul said in Romans 16, verse 18. He said, here's what people do to believe a lie. Romans 16, 18. He said, for they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. Individuals who don't consult the confirmed word of God can very, very likely hear a lie and not even know it. Because, oh, some of these preachers, boy, they, they sound pretty good. Smooth, you know, silver-tongued devils, what they are. They speak good words, fair speeches. I think about Joel Osteen, boy, he got a, you know, he's got a million-dollar smile, and he just, oh, he looks so slick and sharp and you know, oh, he just, mm, just makes you feel so good. Talks so sweet and smooth. Sounds good, doesn't it? Oh, yeah. These preachers, they get up and they, they'll, they'll get in the pulpit and they'll tell you, you know, a good story, funny story, and make you feel so good and make you laugh and the music's cranked up and the smoke machine's going and, boy, everybody's swaying. I guess they got their cigarette lighters out. And I know they got the cigarette lighters out because they probably don't have any problem with people smoking. And so they're out, you know, just doing like a concert and everything's good. Boy, it just sounds good. Fair speeches. They're deceiving people. And you know what? That, that's got to be the truth. That's got to be the truth. The preacher said it. It's got to be the truth. Right? Paul said they deceive people with their smooth speeches. Look at this. In Jude, Jude, verse 16. Don't ask me what chapter. Just one little short book. Jude, verse 16. Notice what Jude says. Sorry about that. Jude says, These are, there, these are murmurers, complainers, walking after their own lusts, and their mouth speaketh great swelling words, having men's persons and admiration because of advantage. Do you think there's 
any preachers out here that just say what people want to hear because, well, if I say the right things, these people will give a lot of money or these people give a lot of money and therefore I'm going to say things that will make them stick around. I want to, I want to keep them happy. They, they got the big purse strings, right? Deep pockets. I want to keep them around. They've got men's persons in admiration. It's to their advantage to make them feel good. You know, I, I talk to a lot of people right door knocking, whatever. And I, I know there's a lot of people in this area that used to go to Osborne Baptist, but they're starting to see, you know what? It's just a big social club. It's just a big party atmosphere. It's just for the upper crust, the social elite. Now, what do you think is going on? There's a lot of mouth speaking, swelling words, smooth speeches, making people feel good. Is that really giving people the truth? Is it really giving people the truth if you're telling them what they want to hear as opposed to what they need to hear? Paul said in 2 Timothy chapter 4, he said, I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom. Preach the word, be instant in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with thy longsuffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. Why? Because the truth doesn't sound near as good as a lie. And so that's what happens. You have individuals who are enticed and turned away from the truth because a lie sounds better. Now, here's the way you get someone to believe a lie. First, they have to hear it. The lie has to be spoken. And then, and then they have to see a lie. They see a lie. In other words, if you're telling someone a lie, the first thing you have to do then is convince them that it really is the truth. All right, you make it real to them. Look what Zechariah says in Zechariah 10. Zechariah 10, verse 2. Now, we're going we're gonna to make some application here in just a moment. Zechariah 2.10. For the idols have spoken vanity, and the diviners have seen a lie, and have told false dreams. They comfort in vain, therefore they went their, uh, therefore they went their way as a flock. They were troubled because there was no shepherd. Now, what happened? Well... The dreamers and the diviners, yeah, they, they saw a lie and they started telling it. They started telling what they saw and got people to believe it. And they made it sound so good. You know what? There's been whole religions that started based upon someone seeing a vision or a dream and then telling that dream, telling that lie and getting people to believe it. You know what? One of them is, one of them is the uh, religion of Islam. Yeah, yeah, Muhammad, he had a dream. Isn't that crazy? People believe in dreams? And this is where they start? And there's a lot of people go, wow, you know what? You, you might not have known that. Yeah, Muhammad had a dream. He had visions. And oh, boy, look what we have today. You see how telling a dream or having a dream and telling a lie, see where it gets us? Yeah, that's right. It, it, gets, you, it gets you in all kinds of trouble, all kinds of false doctrines to rise. You say, well, man, we need to get rid of these folks that see dreams, that have dreams and visions, and, and then tell lies and lead people astray. That's right. Well, you can start with Islam, but you know what? Then how about you take off, how about then you go after the Latter-day Saints? Joseph Smith had a dream, too. He had a vision. Saw an angel. Oh, well, you know what? Then you need to get to the Seventh-day Adventists because Ellen G. White had a dream, too. She saw a vision. You, oh, you know what? Maybe you need to get, go to the apostolics next. You know why? Because they're, one of their core doctrines started as a result of seeing a vision, and then they come up with this baptism in the name of Jesus only business. Oh, see what we're doing here? Someone saw a dream, had a dream, had a vision, told that dream, made it sound real good and pretty, and everybody, oh, that, that's got to be God talking to them. Yeah, let's follow him. Smooth speeches. They see a dream or they, they, uh, they speak a lie. Then they have a dream to confirm that lie. And boy, we're just 
hoodwinking people. We're drawing them in, sucking them in. Make them feel good, sound good, looks good. Well, that's how you start believing a lie. That's how you start believing a lie. But the bottom line is, but the bottom line is, if you really want people to believe a lie, here's ultimately what you have to do. And here's what is the basis, really, of this. Is you've got to convince people in some way, shape, that what they're saying and doing and hearing and seeing and feeling is the truth. Look at this. 1 Kings 22 and verse 10. 1 Kings 22 and verse 10. <clears throat> you know how Ahab was uh, convinced to believe a lie? Now, if you read 1 Kings 22, you'll find that behind the scenes, behind the sp scenes, God allowed a lying spirit to convince Ahab to go up to Ramoth Gilead where he would die, where he'd be killed. But this is what it looked like to King Ahab. So he, could, he didn't know what was going on behind the scenes. But this is what it really looked like. The king of Israel, that's Ahab, and Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, sat each on his throne, having put on their robes in a void place in the entrance of the gate of Samaria, and all the people prophesied before him. And Zedekiah, the son of Cheniah, made him horns of iron, and he said, Thus saith the Lord, with thee shalt thou push the Syrians until thou have consumed them. And all the prophets prophesied so, saying, Go up to Ramoth Gilead and prosper, for the Lord shall deliver it into the king's hand. Now can't you just see, can't you just see that show? Here's Zedekiah making horns of iron. And I'm going to see him going, oh yeah, go up to Ramoth Gilead, look how... Look how uh, the Lord's going to deliver him. Push the Syrians. I can just see him running around with these horns on his head, making, a, making a, a, a fool of himself, really. But see what he's doing? He's showing Ahab. He's, he's giving him something to believe in, something he can see. And that, that sounds a whole lot better than what Micaiah is going to tell him later on. Now, friends, my, my point is this. There's a lot of individuals today who are, have believed a lie because a preacher came along and spoke a lie because the preacher has seen a lie and then he showed that lie to those people. He painted a pretty picture about what it's going to be. You don't believe that preachers paint a picture of what lies really are? You don't think that? You don't think that Benny Hinn and uh, Kenneth Copeland and Joel Osteen and uh, Creflo Dollar and all these guys that are name it, claim it, and health and wealth, you don't think that they're painting a picture for someone? That they're like Zedekiah, they've got their own version of these iron horns and they're telling people, oh, you just sow a seed and, and the Lord will bless you. They're painting a picture for these people that they can see just as, as clearly that this is how the Lord is going to bless me if I'll just do what this man says. So he gets them to believe a lie by talking the lie and then showing them a lie. Demonstrating in some way something that would cause them to say, yeah, if I just sow my seed into this ministry. I can't remember his name. The guy that plays the piano, the keys, the, the key guy. You know, all he's all to, oh, you had to sow a seed into, into uh, his ministry. You know, Oral Roberts and all these guys. But you know what? Those guys, Kenneth Copeland and, and, uh, uh, and Benny Hinn and all these guys, they're the big dogs. And all these guys around here in this area, they want the same thing. They want to be where they are. There's a... There's a uh, Church right down the street from where we meet, right there on the boulevard. It's called Shaw Christian Church. Shaw Christian Church. And the and the and the 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 the, the lady preacher, so called preacher, Reverend, I think her name. You know, Shaw stands for spiritual healing and wealth, is what she said. That's a lie. That's a lie. There's no spiritual healing in the, in the Christian church. And there's certainly no none of this name it, claim it 
stuff existing today according to the Bible. You got big benches out there. Shaw. S H A W right on right on the on the sidewalk. I didn't know what that meant for a long time. I thought S H A W on those park benches. I thought that just meant sit here and wait. Because if you expect what denomination denominational doctrine is teaching you about spiritual healing and wealth, you're gonna be sitting and waiting a long time. Now, someone's painted the picture and said, this is what the truth really looks like. But it's not, friend. It's not. And so ultimately, in order to convince people to believe a lie, the bottom line is you have to change the truth to a lie. That's really what you do. When you speak a lie and show people a lie, you really change the truth to a lie. Now look at this in Romans 1, verse 25. Romans 1, and verse 25. Paul says <clears throat> that these individuals changed the truth of God into a lie and worshipped and served the creature more, more than the Creator who, cre who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause God gave them up to vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men leaving the natural use of the woman burned in their lust one toward another, men with men working that which is unseemly and receiving in themselves the recompense of their error which was meat. Uh, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. They changed the truth to a lie. And so the lie then becomes the truth. The lie becomes the truth. You know, the Nazi, Nazi hitman, Goebbels, said, if you repeat a lie often enough, people will believe it. And you will even come to believe it yourself. Friends, you know, this is what, this is what politicians do. They'll tell you a lie. And they'll say it long enough and over and over enough to repeat it enough and get people to repeat it for them. And then that becomes the truth when really it's a lie. Things that didn't even happen. You repeat it long enough, convincing enough, and, and people will believe it. People will believe it. And so that's the way it is in, 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 in religion. People hear a lie. They hear it long enough. Convincing enough, and pretty soon they and pretty soon they believe it. You're on the word from the Lord. Not only that, uh, James, it becomes a family tradition if they stay in it long enough. That's exactly right. Exactly right. Passed down generation to generation, don't it? Right, and it's harder, harder for them to break that than to go out here and, and uh, break a, a twig off a, a dead tree. <laughs> right. Sure enough. They, they, That's right. They, uh, they, they don't want to believe that their parents uh, told them the wrong way or whatever, and, didn't, and, and they learned the wrong way. They, they, they just want to be like, just like their parents or something instead of picking up a <coughs> book or get somebody to show them the truth out of the Scripture. Right. Appreciate your program. Right. All right. Thanks for the call. All right. That's right. When you hear something long enough and, and often enough and convincingly enough, even if it's the truth, you know, they're going to hold on to that lie because the truth has been changed into a lie. The lie has then become the truth. And friends, that's exactly what happens. Men, men soon become wiser in their own eyes than God. If you go back to Romans chapter 1, notice this in verse 21. Paul said, because that when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. So much smarter than the God who created them. They became fools. They're so wise, they became fools. Now friends, this is exactly how people start believing a lie. The lie is repeat, repeated. The lie becomes the truth. And then the truth itself seems so strange that just can't be right, people think. And thus, 
uh, Peter would say they're willfully ignorant of the real truth. Paul said they did not like to retain God in their uh, knowledge of God in their minds. Peter said in 2 Peter 3, 2 Peter 3 and verse 5, notice what he says. For this they willingly are ignorant of. Let's back up. Let's go to verse 3. Knowing this, that, the, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lust and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they, uh, as they were from the beginning of the creation. For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. But the heavens of the, uh, and the earth, which are now by the same word are kept in store, reserved in the fire against the day of judgment, against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men, willfully ignorant about the truth, willfully ignorant of the real truth because the lie sounds better. The lie sounds better. Friends, you don't think that this is a problem? You don't think that this is really the way it works? I want you to consider something about evolution. You know, it used to be evolution was scoffed at. It was ridiculed, laughed out of town. No one accepted evolution. But now, it is the truth. It's the accepted truth, if you will, by so many people in our public schools, in our, in our universities, uh, across the board in, in, uh, in, in the world. Evolution is, even though it's called a theory, it's accepted as truth. And when you present truth, you're scoffed at, you're ridiculed. Laugh to scorn. Oh, truth, that's just, that's just a theory. But yet they don't even allow, allow truth to be taught as a theory. But instead, evolution, which is nothing but a theory, and a weak one at that, is accepted as truth. And the result is, our society now has gotten further and further away from other truths because of evolution. Because after all, if we're just an animal, see, if we're just an involved animal, we're just a higher, higher form of primate, we're really not that much different than animals. And so, from there, anything goes. For example, look at this. Since the 1970s, the consensus of the behavioral and social sciences and the health and mental health professions uh, globally is that homosexuality is a normal variation of human sexual orientation. Now, it used to not be that way. It used to be that homosexuality was a disorder, a mental disorder, that it was abnormal behavior. But here's what happens. Look, evolution comes on a rise, and all of a sudden we're just animals, right? We're just giving it to our primate or prim, primal uh, urges and desires or whatever. We're just animals. Give it over to our, uh, the lust of our flesh, our animal instincts or whatever they want to say. And so that has to be normal. That has to be normal. In, 19, in 1973, the American Psychiatric Association declassified homosexuality as a mental disorder. The American Psychological Association Council of Representatives followed suit in 1975. So they're, slowly but surely, they're accepting a lie. They're accepting a lie. Now, now watch where it goes. Soon after that, other major mental health organizations started following until it was finally de declassified by the World Health Organization. Who? Yeah, that's right. Who? WHO the World Health Organization in 1990. That's the UN, by the way. And so, you see where we come? 1973, it started to be declassified until eventually the whole world is declassifying homosexuality as <clears throat> a mental disorder. Now it's, it's, no longer, it's no longer a mental disorder. 
Now here's where we are. Some individuals still believe that homosexuality is a mental disorder. The current research and clinical literature demonstrates that same-sex sexual and romantic attractions, feelings and behaviors are normal and positive variation of human sexuality. Alright? Look, current research and clinical literature demonstrate. How do they demonstrate it? They say it. They just say it. If they say it's the truth, well, it's got to be the truth, right? Hey, if it's written down in an article somewhere and some doctor signed his name to it, it's got to be the truth, right? You, you can't say it's wrong if some doctor with a PhD and an LMNOP after his name say it's true. It's got to be right. Saw it on the internet. Read it on the World Wide Web. It's got to be true. No, that doesn't make it true. It just makes it seem true. But now watch this. You see, here's the progression. In 2013, the American Psychiatric Association uh, <clears throat> in, uh, in 2003, the, uh, uh, let's see, the American, find the name here, the American uh, Psychiatric Association declassified pedophilia and said that pedophilia was no longer a disorder, right? But that it was simply a sexual orientation. Now there's a public outcry and they changed it back. But be sure that with a little time, the lie will become truth and pedophilia will no longer be a disorder. It will no longer be a mental disorder. It will no longer be something that's taboo. It will be, yeah, it's, it's just normal. It'll never be normal, friends, except in the minds of individuals who have believed a lie. All right? Now, you say, well, James, I, I can see where that would take place and how, how people might believe that is a lie. But you know what, friends? It takes place in all aspects of religion. I want you to consider this. Here's an article, here's a, or a page from the Baptist Manual. Baptist Manual. And notice what this says. It said, It is most likely that in the apostolic age when there was but one Lord, one faith, and one baptism, and no differing denomination existed. The baptism of a convert by the very act constituted a member of the church and once endowed him with all rights and privileges of full membership. In that sense, baptism was the door into the church. Now it is different. And while churches are desirous of receiving members, they are wary and cautious that they do not receive unworthy persons. Now, friends, there is so much information in this article. I want you to consider this. When individuals get upset and they say that we're lying when we say there's only one church in which you must be a member in order to be saved, they say we're lying. But notice this, who changed the truth to a lie? The Baptist manual says in the apostolic age there was but one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Well, that same passage in Ephesians 4.4 4 also says there is one body. Right? One body. The body is the church, Ephesians 1.22 and 23. Colossians 1.18, there is one body, there's one church. So, in the apostolic age, <clears throat> when there was but one church, and one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and no differing denomination existed, they're admitting that in the truth of God's word, there are no denominations. Now, who changed the truth? Who changed the truth, my friend? 
Where's the callers that want to come in and defend the Baptist doctrine? That want to call in and defend the lie that says all churches are okay. Who wants to defend that? You want to say that we're lying when we say that there's only one church in the Bible and you have to be a member of that one church in order to be saved? Christ is the Savior of the body, Ephesians 5 and verse 23. And that we're lying, but notice this. The Baptist manual actually says, in the apostolic age, that's the first century, in the Bible time, when the Bible was being written, there were no differing denominations. There was only one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one body, one church. And baptism of a convert by the very act constituted him a member of the church. Which church? Well, there was only one. It wasn't the Baptist church, though. Baptist church is not in this book. It's not in the faith. So it had to be the church of Christ. And it said that it endowed him with all the rights and privileges of full membership. <coughs> that baptism was the door into the church. Now it's different. Who changed it? Who changed the truth of God into a lie? Who changed it, friend? Wasn't me. Wasn't me. Baptist church came along a long time before I was here. Who changed the truth to a lie? Who's really lying to you, friends? Who's really lying to you when is it us who say there's one church in the Bible and you have to be a member of that one church to be saved? And we're showing you scripture after scripture after scripture that indicates that that one church is the one body in which Christ is going to save. He's the Savior of the body, which is the church. And there's only one body. Therefore, He's the Savior of only one church. Now, who changed the, who changed the truth? Who changed the truth into a lie? Friends, we still have a standing offer, $1,000 to anybody who can, who can find the Baptist church in the Bible. Find the Methodist church in the Bible. Find the Lutheran church in the Bible. It's not in there. Find the Presbyterian church in the Bible. It's not in there. Find the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in the Bible. It's not in there. You know why no one's taking us up on that offer? Because they can't find the denomination that they're in in the Bible. Can't do it. Now, who changed the truth? Is it really members of the, of the Church of Christ that are lying to your friends? Or is it someone else that's lied to you and convinced you of a truth that is really a lie? Who's, who's lying to you? Who's lying to you? All right? Someone calling to give me the answer. Who changed the truth to a lie? Are we the ones lying to you, friends? All we're doing is we're showing you the Bible. We're giving you a word from the Lord. And yet we are told that we're the liars. Who told you? Who told you baptism does not save? Who told you that? Somebody lied to you. Somebody lied to you. If someone told you, well, you don't have to be saved, you don't have to be baptized in order to be saved, someone lied to you, friends. Here's the truth. Here's the truth. In 1 Peter 3, in verse 21, look at this. Verse 20 talks about Noah and the ark. And notice it says, wherein eight souls were saved by water. So water don't save you. Well, here's eight souls that were saved by water. And then Peter says, the like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us. Well, baptism is water, isn't it? Y'all believe in water baptism. I believe in water baptism. I believe that water baptism saves, but I don't believe it's water baptism only. I believe the only thing that makes water baptism save us is the fact that I have been obedient to God who said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Now, I would like for the caller to call in 
last hour to call in to make this point. Make a point about baptism when he said baptism, nobody in the New Testament was saved after baptism. Sir, everybody in the New Testament who was saved was saved after baptism. Look at this. Everybody. All the conversion accounts in the book of Acts. All the conversion accounts in the book of Acts. Individuals were saved, had their sins washed away. That is, their sins were remitted, forgiven, washed away, blotted out, after they obeyed the Lord in being baptized for the remission of sins. Every one of them. Now, when someone says, you don't have to be baptized to be saved, somebody lied to you, friend. Somebody lied to you. I'm not trying to be mean. Maybe I need to smile. Friends, I'm not trying to be your enemy. I'm trying to get you to say, somebody lied to you. Somebody changed the truth to a lie and then convinced you that the lie was the truth. And I'm trying to help you see that somebody lied to you. Somebody lied to you. See, the reason why we have so much trouble in our society with what people believe is because they've been fed a lie, lie after lie after lie. I didn't see the interview on television. I was told about it by the preacher. I don't, I don't know. Maybe, maybe the, the guy that called me can call me and tell me again his name. I think it was Lynch. Somewhere in, in Danville, maybe. And the interview that he did with Jessica Robinson. But saying how I was told, this is why I'm trying to verify, that he said that going to church on Sunday is not important. Here's a study that was done by a Barna, a Barna poll. Americans divided on the importance of the church according to the, a new Barna poll. And here's what it said. It said, church attendance did not crack the top ten things of what help American Christians grow in their faith. Can you imagine that? What helps you grow in your faith? And attending worship was not in the top ten. But here's what the Bible says. The Bible says that when you come together, it's for the purpose of edifying one another. The Bible says that when you come together, it's for the purpose of being uh, built up. Notice this. In 1 Corinthians 14, 1 Corinthians 14, verse 3, uh, I'm sorry, Verse 4, he says, He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself, but he that prophesieth edifieth the church. And then if we come down, I believe it's verse 26. Maybe wrong on this. But verse, uh, yeah, verse 26. He says, How is it then, brethren, when you come together, every one of you have the psalm, have the doctrine, have the tongue, have the revelation, and have the interpretation? Let all things be done unto edifying. The whole world's coming together has been built up. And yet, someone has convinced the world, so-called Christians in the world, that, well, you know what? You, you can be edified. Your faith can grow and, and increase. And you don't, even have to, you don't even have to assemble. You know what? If you're able to assemble with the Lord's church, and you don't, you are not being edified. You are not growing. Your faith is dying. Your faith is dying. Now, is it important? Or who lied to you? Who changed the truth to a lie? You're on the word of the Lord. Hey, James. I, I can understand why their faith wouldn't grow. <laughs> because I, yeah. they're not preaching the word. And... Romans ten seventeen, like Caleb brought up in the previous broadcast, right. faith comes from. Right. I see your point. And, but, you know, it just amazes me that I even individuals who aren't being told the truth wouldn't even see the importance of 
assembling together. You know, I mean, right. but I, but I, but I, I know what you're saying here. They're not getting what would build them up, edified by the word of God. Acts 20 and verse 32, Paul said, uh, what I commend you now to the word of God, the word of his grace, unto God and the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you inheritance among all them which are sanctified. Yeah, they're not, they're not getting the word that builds up, no matter how, how often they assemble. That's true. But some, you know, uh, but people... One quick thing before I, I uh, get offline. Uh, this gentleman that called me on Caleb show, and he brought up uh, John 3.16. Right. Now, in John 3.16, it says, should not perish, not will not perish, correct? Right. That's correct. Uh, I just was confused on why he was bringing that verse up when it doesn't even say that they will not perish. I don't know. It was hard for, I mean, he wasn't, he wasn't even letting, uh, you know, Caleb respond, so you weren't going to make any points with him, I don't think, anyway. Well, thanks for the broadcast. I'll get all right. Now. all right, all right, thanks for the call. But, you see, friends, here's what we're talking about. Someone has convinced people that assembling together with like-minded individuals, whether preaching the truth or not, is of no benefit, no consequence. Now, here's where we have struggles. When we teach someone the truth, let's say they obey the truth, they hear the gospel, they believe the gospel, they obey the gospel, now they're members of the, of the body of Christ. Now, they have been taught a, a lie that says, it doesn't matter if you assemble. So now there's one, there's one more area that we have to, un, uh, uh, they have to unlearn a lie and learn a truth. It is imperative, it is important that you assemble with the saints on the first day of the week because that's what the Bible commands, Acts 20, verse 7. See that? And so you can see the damage that is being done when individuals hear a lie because someone has spoken a lie, shown them a lie, changed the truth to a lie, and then thus they believe a lie. They believe a lie. And that's why Paul said in 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 11, he said, For this cause God shall send them a strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believed not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. They have been deluded, deceived, and thus they believe a lie. Because the lie becomes the truth to them and the truth becomes foreign to them and thus it's too hard for them to turn around. You know, it's easier to believe a lie. It's been said it's easier to believe a lie one has heard a thousand times than to believe a fact that one has never heard before. And that's where we are, friends. That's why we are doing what we're doing. We're trying to help you to see through the lies. See through the lies. That's why we are speaking the truth to you in order to get you to believe the truth, so then you can turn around and obey the truth. And if we can assist you, well, I'm out of time, but if we can assist you, friends, <clears throat> that's exactly what we want to do. We want to help you learn the truth, believe the truth, so you can obey the truth and stop believing a lie. If we can assist you in any way, we want to do that very thing. 276-340-2653, so you can reach me. Till next time, friends, always make sure you're getting a word from the Lord. Have a good night.